Hey, how's it going? Uh, my name is Stefan Richter. I am a pulmonology and critical care uh, instructor at UCLA. Um, and I'm involved through uh, the Ping Watson side of things. Um, my project is not very focused on cardiovascular outcomes. It's actually more of an infectious disease epidemiology thing. And I'm getting my PhD in the Department of Health Policy and Management at the School of Public Health, um, which used to be called Health Services and Outcomes. Um, so without further ado, what I'm giving here is a somewhat condensed version of my thesis proposal defense, uh, which I defended at the end of uh, December. So this is, there's a lot of sort of proposed research here and directions. Um, go over an introduction, brief description of the data set, and then the two major projects of my thesis. Um, so I'm focusing here on multidrug resistant organisms, uh, which are one of these, you know, quasi-apocalyptic threats that are arising in the U.S. at this point. Uh, if you find the right numbers, you can find people who are saying that they're going to be uh, responsible for something like $50 trillion of lost income and lives over the next 50 years worldwide. Um, I think that might be a little bit overblown, but it's a nice top line number to sort of put at the top of grant applications. Um, but they are a, a serious issue that's becoming substantially more uh, difficult to manage. Um, and the problem that we're dealing with is we don't know when someone comes into the hospital what their chance is of actually having a multidrug resistant infection. We've got some decent heuristics at this point, but they're not really good enough to sort of precision guide therapy. And the idea is that in the area of electronic medical records, we can do better. Um, so if you get this wrong, if you undertreat antibi um, an antibiotic resistant infection, you have a substantially increased length of stay and in some cases increased mortality. Um, you overtreat these and give sort of broad spectrum antibiotics to everybody, uh, it does increase your risk for multi drug resistant organisms down the road. Um, so, sort of pitching your initial approach correctly has benefits on both sides. Um, a lot of times, this happens in the absence of complete information. Typically, people will come in, you'll think that they have an infection. Um, these infections are characterized gram negative, gram positive. Gram positive impure coverage is a little bit less interesting because there are fewer. Uh, antibiotics that we use for gram-positive coverage and the risk of developing resistance is substantially lower. Um, but the gram-negatives, you cover everybody who comes in with a suspected infection, you cover them for gram-negatives, and there are sort of a lot of options and a lot of ways that things can go wrong. The problem is when somebody comes in, you typically have a day or two before you even find out what type of organism they have, whether it's gram-positive or gram-negative, and then it can take another two or three days beyond that to get the full um, <clears throat> name of the organism and what its resistance pattern is. Uh, and these decisions typically need to be made within the first several hours, so before any of that information comes back. There are not very many algorithms that actually tell you what to do. A lot of people have looked at risk factors for resistance to particular antibiotics, but usually it's been in very specific populations. For example, um, they'll be looking at bone marrow transplant recipients, or they'll be looking at a single type of organism. And again, if you're waiting until you have the name of the organism, you're already three or four days outside of the point where you need to make this decision. Um, I'll get back to this later, but there's one algorithm that's very widely used. It's called HCAP, which stands for Healthcare Associated Pneumonia. Um, it was originally developed for pneumonia, but it's sort of de facto used to determine the antibiotic resistance uh, chance for most organisms, uh, whether they're coming in with a urinary tract infection or bloodstream uh, infection or a pneumonia. And essentially, uh, the question is, has this person been in contact with the medical field in the last 60 days? And if the answer is yes, you pull out the big guns. And if the answer is no, maybe you don't unless they're really sick, in which case you pull out the big guns anyways. So it's a, it's a relatively blunt instrument. Um, and it's very conservative in terms of going, you go big most of the time. Uh, um, to talk about the data set that I have, this is available through UCLA. Um, it's called the XDR. Uh, it's a clinical data repository. It pulls all of our data from CareConnect and puts it into a giant warehouse. It's been uh, archiving data since we went electronic in 2006 um, through 2016, but um, they changed over the way that uh, the system we're using sort of writes data and the type of data that's used in late 2011. Um, and data before that is not terribly uh, complete and actually misses a lot of the information that I need. So my data set is everybody ages 18 or above 
who said at least one positive culture from any source um, in the last, you know, six years. So I've got 2011 through 2016. Um, that comprises 20 to 30,000 patients, depending on how I slice it. Um, here's a table of extracted measures. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but essentially I've got how old the person is, gender, race, ethnicity, social history, which hospital they're at. UCLA has both uh, UCLA Ronald Reagan's main campus, and uh, we have a campus at Santa Monica. I have where they were prior to admission, which turns out to be incredibly important if the person was admitted from a long-term acute care facility or even a nursing home, uh, and then in the hospital, whether they're an intensive care unit or not. Um, a list of comorbidities, I'm using the Elix Hauser score for this one as opposed to the Charleston Comorbidity Index because it gives a little bit more granularity and actually allows me to break out those disease categories substantially more um, individually, which turns out to be important for the model. Uh, vital signs, the lab results, the medications I got, microbiology results as well. Um, so project number one is three very similar papers that's essentially asking what is your risk for developing or having resistance to given antibiotics. And the one that I've been focusing on so far is colistin, uh, which I'm doing a little bit differently. There are some relatively common organisms that have resistance to colistin already, intrinsic resistance. I've actually excluded them from the data set because I think that um, development of resistance, if you go from an organism that doesn't have col uh, colistin resistance and develop colistin resistance, this is sort of a last line antibiotic. It turns out that those organisms are sort of the worst of the worst. They have an incredibly high rate of resistance to other antibiotics, and there's not really a well-established antibiotic regimen for them. Um, so to give a sense um, of what we're dealing with, we've got uh, about 128 cholestin-resistant organisms in the entire data set. Um, if I were to include intrinsic resistance, we'd be dealing with something like 2,500 uh, organisms. And so a predictive model that included intrinsic resistance would essentially say, do I have a proteus infection or a providentia infection? And those infections are actually relatively easy to treat. They just happen to have intrinsic resistance to cholestin. So um, essentially project, uh, paper one of the project is going to be looking, is going to be looking at risk factors for developing resistance. The other papers will be looking at intrinsic resistance as well. Um, and then in terms of how to actually uh, apply this information that's more a, a feature of project two. Um, the conceptual model here is very basic and needs a little bit of work, but essentially I'm using this to organize the risk factors that I um, demonstrated on the previous screen. And what I'm essentially saying is you've got uh, patients with a certain amount of chronic illness um, and, and chronic comorbidity, and that leads through a variety of pathways to your acquisition of antibiotic resistance, whether that is directly mediated by the current acute illness or the exposure to prior infection, um, and presumably uh, prior exposure to antibiotics has a lot to do with this. The problem is that I only have data from patients during their inpatient stays and only during their inpatient stays at UCLA, so a lot of what happens prior to a patient's admission obviously happens outside of the hospital. So. I don't have whether a person received antibiotics just prior to admission. The closest that I have to that is whether the person was in a nursing home or what their sort of list of comorbidities is. So it could be that this entire model is driven by prior exposure to antibiotics. And the only thing that I have to proxy for that is where they were prior to their infection and uh, prior to their admission and what their actual chronic illness pattern is. So paper one is about colistin. Colistin, as I said, is a last line antibiotic. It essentially fell out of favor because you can nuke somebody's kidneys and cause neurologic damage if you don't know what you're doing. We're actually much better at using it now uh, in much less toxic amounts. So it still carries these risks, but substantially less. Uh, we sort of keep it in our back pocket for people with these worst of the worst infections, sort of multi-drug resistant, polydrug resistant organisms. Um, and in order to treat an organism that has colistin resistance, uh, it requires really an infectious disease specialist consultation and very prolonged therapy. Um, so none of this sort of first line uh, choices is really going to be effective at all in these patients.
Uh, again, this is going to be true for all of these, but prior research was relatively limited in scope, very small sample sizes, up to a few hundred, um, and it focused usually on unique patient groups. Um, and again, nobody's really made any decision rules on the basis of this research. So 28,000 isolates from about 20,000 patients. I uh, had a total of 128 cholesterol-resistant isolates. I'm focusing specifically on Klebsiella pneumonia because as you'll see, it's relatively overrepresented in the colistin resistant group. Um, uh, Acinetobacter is as well, but it's a much less common infection. And then there's a respiratory source for culture, um, which is much more common. Typically, if you're looking at non-resistant organisms, uh, gram-negative organisms, a lot of them are in the urine. If you're looking at um, resistant organisms, a lot more of those are in the uh, lungs. So this is a trend in colistin resistance over time. You can see this is still a relatively rare outcome, but in 2016, the prevalence got as high as 1.6%. Uh, and again, here's Klebsiella. You can see in terms of colistin sensitive organisms, it's only 16%, but it's over two thirds of the colistin resistant organisms. So there's a separate part of this analysis that says once you have this, the uh, species and before you get the full resistance patterns, can we do better? In predicting whether your Klebsiella specifically is resistant to colistin. Um, again, the distribution of the culture type, you'll notice that among both respiratory, uh, among both uh, all gram negatives, respiratory cultures are overrepresented, and then the same thing for Klebsiella as well. Um, I'm not going to go through this entire table of selected by varied associations, but essentially. Um, I'm looking at this for gram negatives and for Klebsiella. Um, you can see a lot of the um, associations here uh, have more to do with where the patient is during the hospitalization and factors about the patient as opposed to demographics, which are relatively unhelpful. So if you're admitted from a facility, that's one of the huge uh, risk factors here. If you are in an ICU, if you're ever in an ICU during your index hospitalization, um, if you have current carbapenem resistance, obviously this is not helpful for predicting because you get the information about carbapenem resistance at the same time that you get it about colistin resistance, but this is just to demonstrate that a lot of these people with the colistin resistance are resistant to many, many other antibiotics. But it turns out that having resistance to carbapenems on a prior culture is actually hugely predictive as well. Um, having the indwelling devices, whether that's a urinary catheter, a tracheostomy, or a mechanical ventilation um, is a huge risk factor. And then coming down here, the elix hazard score is your comorbidity index, but a lot of this is actually driven by the construct of what's called neurologic disease. The elix hazard comorbidity index is essentially just a list of ICD-9 and now ICD-10 codes that uh, map to given constructs. Neurologic disease is very chronic debility. It covers seizures, but it also covers people with degenerative myopathies, degenerative neuromuscular disorders, uh, multiple sclerosis, um, Huntington's chorea, paralysis, extended paralysis, um, things like that. So this is sort of the people who are incredibly bed bound. A lot of them are developmentally uh, delayed, which is not covered in the Elix Hauser set, but uh, this serves as sort of a proxy to that. Um, the other thing that I'm looking at here is the number of days since receipt of a medication. Um, and and so when this says days since last antibiotics, it's an average of 17.6 days with a standard deviation of 36. Um, I've since redone the analysis. This is a non-parametric test. The p-values look surprisingly similar because a lot of them are very significant. Um, and the question is essentially, how long has it been since you received your last advanced carbapenem? Advanced carbapenems being anything besides ertapenem, which is technically a carbapenem, but a little bit uh, weaker. Um, and then last time you received colistin, last time you received what, we, what I'm going to call an anti-MRSA agent, um, which are essentially these specialized agents that are uh, against methicillin resistant staph aureus. Um, these agents are used, uh, this comes up in the model, so I'm going to dive into it a little bit more, but the uh, anti-MRSA agents are used when you suspect that a person has sepsis or septic shock. Um, everybody gets a dose of vancomycin or something similar to it. And so my suspicion is that this proxies how long it's been since somebody thought the patient was septic, um, as opposed to any actual mechanistic um, way of receiving vancomycin, specifically inducing antibiotic resistance. 
Um, there's some interesting ones here, analyst acid suppressants. So proton pump inhibitors have been implicated in uh, development of pneumonia and a couple of other things just because they uh, sort of deplete the body's natural resources. I'm not really sure why that would lead to um, antimicrobial resistance, but it probably is a proxy for, again, chronic illness of some sort. And then the receipt of a probiotic, I thought was actually one of the more interesting ones. Um, and I think that that primarily is an indicator of people who have received antibiotics and somebody gave them a probiotic as well um, to sort of stave off antibiotic resistant or antibiotic caused diarrhea. Um, chemotherapy, it turns out, doesn't help uh, you predict very much. A lot of immunosuppressants don't actually lead to any increased risk. And then the receipt of a last blood product is sort of in the same category as last probiotic. My guess is it's a marker for chronic illness. This is the actual specification of the model. Um, I won't spend too much time on this, but essentially you've got the construct of neurologic disease, whether the person was in a facility prior to admission, whether they received a carbapenem, an advanced carbapenem in the last night. 90 days, and I just dichotomized this to 90 days, um, partially because that's what the literature does, and partially because it improves the interpretability of the model without dropping your uh, ROC, uh, AUC. Um, advanced O2 essentially means is this person on a mechanical ventilation or a, a, an external face mask? Um, and then prior carbapenem resistance is do you have infection with an organism that had carbapenem resistance? What's not on here is prior receipt of colistin. Um, which is a little bit surprising, but I think that the uh, prior receipt of an advanced carbapenem and the advanced oxygen requirement actually proxy and probably better address whatever construct um, the prior receipt of colistin was addressing. This is the uh, ROC curve, gets you an AUC of about 0.81, and this is for the gram-negative rods. Um, if you convert this over to a score and essentially give one point for each thing on this list, you can see that at the lowest risk, you're practically zero. At the highest scores, four or five, you've got a risk of about 3.5%. The question is, is that actionable? And again, that's the focus of part two. Um, looking at the model for cholesterol-resistant Klebsiella, it's very similar. The only difference is instead of looking at advanced oxygen receipt, you're looking at receipt of an anti-MRSA agent within the last... 90 days. And the AUC for this is substantially better, 0.89. Um, and partially that's because you're looking at a less rare occurrence. So at the highest rate, um, you end up with a cholestin resistance of nearly 10%. And I would argue that that's very actionable. Uh, um, but again, we'll get into that. So paper two and three are essentially exactly the same analysis, except with two different antibiotics, uh, antibiotic classes. The first one is carbapenems, the second one is aminoglycosides. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on these because they're exactly identical, but essentially uh, carbapenems, um, resistance patterns are substantially more common to carbapenems, um, but typically when people have looked at carbapenems, they're looking at CRE, carbapenem resistant enterobacteriaceae, and that's because this is becoming a reportable disease. Um, carbapenem resistant gram-negative rods in general um, would also include acinetobacter and pseudomonas, uh, which have high levels of intrinsic resistance and high levels of developed resistance. Um, but people haven't really looked at prediction algorithm there. Uh, so for the planned analysis, I'm going to be treating ertapenem and non-ertapenem carbapenem separately. A lot of times they're linked together, but in this case, uh, they're actually used differently in clinical practice. So I'm interested in the difference between those two. Um, and I'll probably include organisms with intrinsic resistance because this is much more a treatment-based decision. Um, again, so we're looking at much, much higher rates of resistance. 35% um, of isolates in the data set are resistant to ertapenem, and 12% of the isolates are resistant to advanced carbapenems. Um, if you drop out pseudomonas, which has intrinsic resistance, and a couple of others that have intrinsic resistance, you're actually down to about 9% resistance. Um, but again, I'm probably going to keep it to including intrinsic resistance because it's a clinically actionable decision. Um, aminoglycosides basically exactly the same, except these virtually haven't been studied at all in terms of prediction algorithms. Um, that's pretty much all I have to say about it. 18% uh, resistant to aminoglycosides, so fairly common. People just don't use aminoglycosides that often, but I think they're coming into favor. Project two is looking at how this actually shakes out in terms of real decision analysis. Um, so, a lot of the research, as I said, pre has previously been done on a single rule, which is these HCAP guidelines. 
um, which kind of started off as a project about whether or not to treat for healthcare associated or ventilator associated pneumonia, whether to bring out the big guns or not. And essentially because it was the dominant decision rule and there weren't any others, people now use these guidelines as a general heuristic for whether you're going to be treating broadly or treating narrowly when somebody comes in with an infection. Uh, the HCAP guidelines are very simple. Um, even in their most extreme form, it comes down to, you know, were you in a hospital in the last 60 days? Did you receive dialysis in the last 60 days? Are you super sick? And if the answer to any of those is yes, then you uh, treat with broad spectrum antibiotics. And I think that we can do better. So the essential research question, this is from a hospital cost perspective, is for a patient with a gram negative infection and suspected resistance to a given antibiotic, what's the threshold probability of resistance uh, where you have equipoise between treating with that regimen and an alternate regimen. So I'm going to be looking at this for three different uh, antibiotics, the ones in part one, so colistin, carbapenems, and aminoglycosides. And essentially the question is, somebody comes in, I suspect that patient of having a carbapenem-resistant infection. Should I treat with carbapenems or should I treat with an alternate regimen that would deal with that resistance pattern? Um, it turns out that the consequence side of the tree looks very different for patients who are severely ill versus patients who aren't. And I'm looking at the BSI MRS, which is the bloodstream infection mortality risk score. Um, there are a couple other ones. There's a PIT bacteremia score. The PIT bacteremia score is actually subsumed in the BSI MRS. Um, but I can essentially say if somebody comes in and they're super sick or somebody said, comes in, they say they're not super sick. Um, if you are in this super sick category, you have a substantial risk for mortality, then getting the antibiotic right in the first few hours reduces your risk of mortality, does an absolute risk reduction of about five to 10%, which is fairly substantial. It turns out that if you're not at high risk for mortality, you don't die, no big surprises there, um, but there's still a several day, about a two to four day decrease in hospital length of stay if you get the antibiotic correct. So this is a sample decision tree for somebody coming in with a severely severely ill with a gram-negative rod infection. Let's say the antibiotic here is carbapenems. And you can essentially say, this is the point where we make the decision. Um, if you give the antibiotic and the infection is sensitive, you have a certain risk of living, a certain risk of dying, and then you have mortality as an outcome. And then all of your sort of bang on costs here with length of stay, et cetera. Um, and you can see the other limbs of this tree, the infection isn't sensitive, or you give an alternative regimen and you get it right or you get it wrong. Um, a lot of these data are taken from literature reviews, which I've already managed to do. Um, the calculation for the ranges of chance of effectiveness is gonna be primarily taken from project one. So for colistin, you know, I can say your chance of your of colistin being an effective and antibiotic uh, is probably close to 95% in most cases, you know, 90% if you've got Klebsiella, but a reasonable range would be, you've probably got a zero to, you know, a nine, like an 85 to 100% chance of getting it right if you use colistin, whereas these other um, regimens are probably going to be effective, but they cost a lot more and take a lot more time. Um, yeah, it's a sort of general decision tree making. Anyways, that's it for the, uh, the main presentation. I'm happy to take questions at this point. Do we have any questions for Stefan? Uh, Stephanie, I don't have a question. I have a comment. Okay. I think it's very rewarding to see how you actually applying uh, these big data analytics into the everyday practices. That oh. the understanding that uh, you have on the data sets and that the understanding you have on the predictive models, this has been very impressive. Um, I don't know if Carol's online, but for sure, I'm sure she would be so proud of you as well. She was there for the proposal defense, so. That's excellent. That's that's outstanding. Yeah, uh, I don't know. Is David online? David, do you have a question? Uh, no, I don't have any specific question. 
thank you so much.